All right, we'll introduce ourselves. Um, welcome, my name is Tara Pensky. And I'm Megan. And we own Amadeus Aromatherapy. Some of you have been in our classes before. Some of you have seen us out in public uh, at different places that we go to different fairs and different events. But tonight, we are virtual from part of our dining room. So <laughs> along the line, um, you know, doing this at home has been very interesting. Along the line, Every once in a while, you might hear a dog bark. Uh, hopefully, that will not be the case. My husband is home with us tonight, so he he is out, actually out back with the dogs, trying to keep them calm. But every once in a blue moon, the cat wakes up and will make an appearance. Uh, we normally don't do any product making in this area, so the, the cat's usually not involved in anything that we do, but she's she's sleeping now. So hopefully, that will keep us uh, undercover uh, with her. Anyway, what are we making? Well. We're making a healthy hand scrub tonight. And it's very, very simple. We're gonna show you different products that you can use. So many of them are right in your homes. And uh, the product that we're making here tonight is very versatile, it's very flexible. If you don't like one thing, you can substitute it for something else. If you don't have one product on hand, you can absolutely substitute that out. We're also going to add just a little bit of of bling to this. We're gonna be putting some herbs in our hand scrub, um, some fruits, some citruses. We'll talk all about that. Um, I'm not sure if we'll use rose. Rose always makes it look so pretty. We'll talk about that as we go. So you ready to jump into this? Yeah. All right. So if you have any questions along the line, you just ask. There's a raise your hand feature, but you can unmute yourself and ask too. Um, and then this way, uh, Kelly can kind of feel that question. Um, Kelly, is there, there's a chat feature as well, I do believe, on, on your, your screen? Yeah, so if anybody wants to throw a question in there, I could, you know, unmute myself and then just say, oh, somebody has a question. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and hopefully Feel you, know, free. you can answer it and, and lead you in the right direction. So you ready, Megan? Yeah. All right, so healthy hand scrub. I actually happen to have one here. Um, I keep scrubs at my kitchen sink, my bathroom sinks. We are artesian soap makers. Uh, so we make handmade soap and you'll, again, you'll see us around selling that. And um, that's something that, it's a passion of mine. Um, I can't use regular products. So things even like ivory soap, which a lot of people go, oh, it's so mild. I can't go near ivory soap at all. So I learned a long time ago first to make scrubs. I actually love scrubs. And then we became soap makers later on. We are living in the middle of a very different uh, time where people are washing their hands, thank goodness, right? It amazes me how many times we have to hear directions about how to wash your hands. Um, but people are also realizing that between harsh soaps, the chemicals in them, um, and again, like that's uh, very commercial brands, those really harsh soaps, they can dry your skin out. Some people are getting irritations. Then you go to the hand sanitizers um, that, you know, are, are brutal. They have a lot of ingredients that are definitely meant to kill germs. They're definitely meant to kill things, say like viruses, bacteria, microbes, but they also take a toll on your skin. There are alternatives to those products that you can use and you can use them right at home. Um, I know even at my job, uh, prior to, to being outside of work now, being at home, um, I always had hand scrubs with me and I also would bring small little bits of uh, soap. We call them soap ends. When you cut the bars of soap, the loaves of soap, you get these little tiny pieces. And I would bring that with me as well. The scrubs are my go-to. Um, so let's take a look at what's going to go into them. This is going to be a salt scrub. Now this scrub we will be using on our hands. It would be used for your kitchen sink, for your bathrooms. Take it along with you if you are a camper, if you are somebody that does a lot of gardening, if you're out by the pool, if you know you're going to be going on a trip, let's say you go to a farmer's market and it's packed with people and you know, you're know you touching things and you don't have uh, something else with you, you have your hand scrub with you, quickly find a little bit of water and you can clean your hands. Ours will be salt based as I mentioned. So you're never going to use this uh, anywhere from your neck down, it's good. Anywhere from your neck up, you're not going to use it. What does that mean? Well, we're using it as a hand scrub, but people will use this particular blend in their shower, um, you know, when they're out, again, outside gardening, if their feet get soaking, uh, get really muddy, they'll take a scrub and clean them off. The only thing is anytime you're using it with your feet, you must be aware of the fact that it can be very slippery. So we always say, if you're going to use this on your feet, use it with some caution. All right, we're ready. 
The other thing, a uh, really quick note, uh, nothing that we say here substitutes any kind of medical advice. Aromatherapy, the art and science of using essential oils to create product is beautiful, has become very, very popular, and um, it is an alternative medicine, but it doesn't replace going to a doctor if you have a medical condition or you're concerned about something. So we always make sure we say that to people. So what's going to go into our scrub tonight, Meg? Three different salts. We're going to use three different salts. Now, let's say you don't have any of these salts. You go, oh my gosh, forget this. I've wasted my time here. Any salt that we use tonight can be simply replaced with good old table salt. Just right out of the, this is iodized table salt. You can use kosher salts. Um, you just want to make sure that the grain is not too thick. A lot of people will say, well, I have Himalayan salt, but it's a really big kind of grain. Absolutely use it if it's not too, too um, sharp on your skin. Some of these grains can be so big that when you go to, to actually rub them on your skin, it hurts, and that's not the idea here. If it's going to hurt you, you're never going to use it, and we wanna make sure you use this. So the very first product that we're going to put into our, our recipe tonight, by the way, we're gonna do about four ounces of uh, salts together. So Megan has with her, we'll show you what we got here. We have a regular old kitchen scale. This is where this kitchen scale has been with us for years. I shouldn't say that it'll break tomorrow with my luck, right? Um, basic kitchen scale. We pretty much only use it for our aromatherapy products. So, um, you know, it's sort of, it, it gets used constantly, but it's not holding a watermelon or something, you know, something really heavy where you're always worried. So Megan is going to take, in this case, we're gonna use a clear, a clear glass bowl but you can do anything you want. You can use, like this is a glass jar, it's got a top on it. When we do anything with aromatherapy, we always use pet plastic when we're at our classes. This is um, a dark color. You can use a dark color glass as well. That would be any color you want. We love cobalt blue. It is the color for Amadeus aromatherapy for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, but I have seen brown, purple, green glass. Uh, you name it, it's out there. You want a colored glass if it's going to be near the sun. My product, when I'm done, will not have direct sun on it. So that's why I can keep it in a, a bowl or I could keep it in a covered jar, something along this line. If I leave it in this bowl, I will actually have a uh, plastic wrap, saran wrap over it so that the essential oils don't escape. And then I just use it as I would a soap at the sink. Um, pet plastic, really quick note. You know, we're in a very environmentally conscious era as well, which is wonderful, especially because here on Long Island, we live in, in such a, a fragile environmental state. The grounds below us, the aquifer, is the same water that we drink. It's the same water we grow things in. Plastic itself can break down. Pet plastic, pet like PET, like the animal, does not break down. That's why you want to use it when you're making any aromatherapy product. Essential oils, they're, they're volatile, but they're also strong, and they can have a reaction with regular old plastic. So um, you always want something called pet plastic. You can absolutely get that right online. SKS packaging, new line, there's a load of places out there. Just type it in, and you get all sorts of different sized jars. People will say, well, really, is there such a difference? Think of it this way. If you have a bottle of regular old filtered water, just, you know, distilled water, whatever it is uh, that you drink, a Poland spring, whatever, um, and you leave it in your car. If you've ever done this before and you come back later on, it's been really hot and you go to drink that water, the water doesn't taste like water. It actually tastes a little bit like chemicals. And that's what it is. The plastic is starting to break down and now you're ingesting that. Pet plastic will not do that. So that's another option to put your product in. So we'll start with some Epsom salt. Now, Megan, you wanna do, Megan's gonna do equal amounts here. So you figure out what you want to do. The, the lovely thing about this recipe, although we have a very specific recipe, you mix and match. If you don't have Epsom salt, use table salt. If you don't have, we're going to use dead sea salt at one point. You know, that's not something most people have on hand. That's okay. We do it in our classes just to show it to you. Um, substitute what you have. If you only have Epsom salt, it makes a great scrub. So why are we putting Epsom salt in? Well, Epsom salt is not even a salt. It's actually something called magnesium sulfate. And the history behind it is Epsom is a city in the area of England known as the Surrey region. And many, many years ago, well over 100 years ago in the 1870s, um, there was a salt mining company, or it was really magnesium sulfate mining company that 
understood that magnesium sulfate was great for the health, it was great for the skin, it was great for the muscles, it's great for the respiratory system, and they started selling it. Well, nobody was buying magnesium sulfate because it really doesn't have quite a catchy, it's not very catchy. So they said, well, let's call it Epsom magnesium sulfate and maybe people will buy it. Still was not much of a seller. So one of the people within the company said, you know, this looks a lot like salt. Why don't we call it Epsom salt and bill it that way? It was a hit. The only problem is that patents weren't what they are today, and this is England on top of it all, and the Epsom salt name became very generic. It was like saying cola kind of thing. Um, so when people, you'll see now in stores, like Dickinson's Epsom salt. So that has become a really generic name, but it does have a history behind it. Why do we want it in a hand scrub? Well, I myself am a big bath person, so I use Epsom salts in a bath, but in a hand scrub, it's wonderful. First of all, when you're using something like an Epsom salt that is melting in your hands as you're washing it, it's getting into your skin. It's amazing for your muscles. It rejuvenates the skin. It actually gets the skin circulating, gives it a little bit of a jump start. If you have any bruising, um, if you have any little nicks, I mean, I, I've been wrestling with a very large, uh, gorgeous rose plant outside, but it is the thorns are brutal on this one plant. So you'll get little nicks here and there if you're out gardening. If you are someone that does anything with say dog training, um, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, when you're holding a leash sometimes, especially if it's a, a dog that's maybe a little, I have a, one of our dogs is a hound dog who, you know, is, is great on a lead, but can, you know, take one look at a leaf and go and jolt at it. And your hands will get a little dry. Epsom salt is wonderful uh, for, for healing skin like that. So we always tell our dog trainer friends, you know, Epsom salt's wonderful. Soak your hands in it. Um, you'll feel rejuvenated. Again, too, anything that you're doing, if you're lifting a lot of things, if you've been outside raking, so many of us now are home and our gardens have become even more important than they normally were. So I know between Megan and I, Megan and I have done things in the garden this year, raking wise, that we probably never would have done. Uh, we both had blisters, <laughs> my hands were aching. Um, and I think you figured we do a lot with our hands, but they were killing me the next day. Epsom salt is wonderful uh, because it does seep into the skin and it does help to rejuvenate those muscles. So we're gonna use a little bit of that in here. The next product that we will use is pink Himalayan salt. This is, again, this is a little bit of a luxury. You, you may have some of this at home, you may not. Pink Eps, uh, pink Epsom salt, <laughs> pink Himalayan salt. That's the problem when you go live. There's no like cut it out or anything like that. Um, anyway, so pink Himalayan salt is said to be about 2,500 to 4,000 years old. Now, how do they know that? I wasn't there at that point when they were, they're mining it, but they know that the depth that they must go into the mountains to get this salt, they can kind of figure out the age that way. Pink Himalayan salt is wonderful. When we're using it as a hand scrub, these will all act as an exfoliant. So they're gonna get our germs off, our microbes, any bacteria that we've gotten, grime, dirt, you name it. But pink Himalayan salt, while you're using it, will open up your respiratory system. Uh, a lot of people have been taking uh, advantage of the, the Himalayan salt caves on Long Island. And I know they're closed right now, but they're wonderful for the respiratory system. They're great mind boosters. They're great for muscle relaxation. Um, Epsom salt, pink Himalayan salt, these also reduce stress. And I don't know about you, but I know even though we seem like we've got it together and we're on top of this and we're doing online learning and this and that, it gets stressful. Moment to moment, you know, little things happen and you're, you feel like you're trapped in your house, you can't get out. These are wonderful stress relievers as well. Sweet. Hey, Tara. Yeah. So we have two questions. Somebody had asked, uh, what if they don't have a scale? And then somebody asked, if you use regular table salt, would that be less beneficial to your skin? No, well, regular table salt is excellent, per specifically because of what it can do for the skin. It's a very small grain. So you're able to, to actually really get it in there. You have to rub a little bit more, but it will clean off the grime, the microbes, the uh, bacteria, things like that. So don't, you know, think about it. I don't know about you guys, but on poultry, I will clean poultry with regular old table salts if I don't have kosher salt. Kosher salt's a little, has a thicker grain. So sometimes people will use that, but listen, you don't have that, you go right for the table salt. If you don't have a food scale, equal amounts, the most 
wonderful thing about this product, uh, product as a whole is that it is very versatile and flexible. You can put in more salt, you can put in less salt. You can mix and match, you may go, oh my God, I hate dead sea salt, it's too wet, we'll talk about that in a minute. You can leave it out. So you can take equal amounts and it's up to you. Uh, four ounces worth is about a half cup of each, give three quarters of a cup of each, give or take. But you don't, again, if you have, you know, a half cup or a quarter cup, just do equal amounts. Or you can, you know, play around with it. Does that, does that answer the question, you think? I think so. Is that good? Okay, I just want to make sure. Um, yes, yes, basically. <laughs> we do things by measurement, but can I just, that's for classes. If you saw me putting some of the stuff together for myself, for our own personal use, I'm like the, the uh, Swedish chef from The Muppet Show. I'm like throwing things in and, you know, uh, you know, we have a soap room that we keep our product in and I'll go down there and just throw things together and it's fun. You know, when we do recipes online, of course, we try to be a little bit more specific so you can, can follow along. But, you know, that's the nice thing about this. It is very versatile. So don't be scared or hesitant to, to mix and match these things up. That's the really cool thing about it. You can't go wrong. That's the other nice thing. Um, if you go, oh, you know, I put too much of this and I'm going to get rid of it. No, use it. It's wonderful. Um, and again, with the table salt, equal amounts also. So just a quarter cup also, or an ounce, or however you want to break it up. All right, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. All right, on to our next salt. Now this one, not so, you know, people listen, you know, people will tell us they use uh, deep sea, oh my gosh, dead sea salt a lot. This particular dead sea salt comes from an area called the Bochum region um, of Israel, believe it or not. And the Dead Sea, we know, has the highest saline count in the world. The Bochum region has the highest saline count in the Dead Sea. So what does that mean? Saline is salt. It's where, where we actually get the salt from. And um, it is very, very therapeutic. People will travel from all over the world to sit in places like the Dead Sea if they have major skin irritations. Um, and I mean like chronic, eczema, psoriasis, IB, things, things that you know modern medicine has medicine for, but is not always effective uh, for everybody. People will seek that out. I always tell the story many years ago when I was in the throes of a major skin issue, which is one thing led to another, how I became an aromatherapist. I actually was trying to figure out ways to either get to Norway, where you have the beautiful uh, medicinal springs, or to get to the Dead Sea so I could soak my body in because I was broken out, um, my hands, my knees, you name it. And my husband thought that, oh, it was going to be like our 10th wedding anniversary and that we were going to take a trip together. I said, no, no, we can't both afford to go. I'm going just for the, the medicinal effects. I never had to go. It turns out I found aromatherapy and that helped me a lot. But the Dead Sea is one of those places that people will travel from all over the world to help heal, heal their skin. Now, the thing with Dead Sea salt, it is a luxury. It's very nice. It can be a little bit expensive. But it's, it's worth it if you have major skin conditions. The only thing is because it has a very high saline count, you're gonna see like with the pink Himalayan salts, it's satisfying, right? With our Epsom salt, it's very loose. You can just kind of really turn it. I can't really do that with my Dead Sea salt. It just kind of is like a clump. That's because, because of the saline content, it's always looking to grab moisture. Yesterday it was very humid in at least in Port Jefferson where we are and I didn't have the air conditioner on all day but I had my salts all set up in their area they were all covered but it didn't matter the, the dead sea salt said oh it's humid great and started to attract itself to um you know the humidity in the air just in my basic house so um it's a little more wet so always be aware if you use dead sea salt in a product it will do that if you are putting anything in your product. We're going to be putting jojoba in. You're going to be putting essential oils in. It will make that dead sea salt seem a little bit wet. And that is exactly what it, it does. It's exactly what it looks like. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. Just know that it will change the consistency a little bit of your product. Oops, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. mademoiselle. So Megan will put in the last little bit of this and she's going to mix this together nicely. You can use a regular old spoon from your kitchen. You may want to use a wire whisk. You can use a chopstick. We love chopsticks. Or you can even use a, would you like a chopstick? 
or you can even use a glass stirring rod. I'm not sure if you guys can see this, it's so transparent. Uh, you can get these right online. Maybe you know a science teacher has one or two of them. They're very easy to get even at a place like Amazon. And you can mix that, but I have news for you, you don't need that. Just a basic spoon or even a fork um, works wonders. So that's easy enough. Megan does it with the chopstick. It gives her something to do. It's lots of fun. Keeps her out of trouble, keeps her off the streets. Anyway, um, I don't know if you wanna show them. It's nice and fluffy at this point. I don't know if you can see. It's nice and fluffy oh, and airy. Um, Did a little bit fall out. Oh, all right. We have to, um, you know, what we should have done is to, we, there's a way to do the split screen where we get, could actually have used a cell phone to also do it at the same time. It's a little more difficult on our end, uh, but it's worth it to make you guys see it, to show it to you. All right. Are there any questions up until this point? Real basic, just, I mean, we, we talk, so it makes it longer, but it's very, it's really a very quick little recipe. Good, all right, we're gonna move on. We'll keep this up here. I'm gonna move my salts out of the way so you can see what we're, we're doing here. Okay, so now, now for the magic. We've got our salts. We have a few other products here. The first thing we're going to do, salt is wonderful. If you only have salt, clean your hands with water and salt, it's wonderful. However, it doesn't really glide as nicely. Um, your hands are left without any extra moisture. So what we do is we put in some Hoyaba oil. If you don't have Hoyaba oil, if you go, and I've never heard of Hoyaba oil, that's okay. Olive oil, a little sweet almond oil, sunflower oil, grapeseed oil. Think of some of the different oils you can get even in the cooking aisle. The only one we tell you not to get is like a canola oil where it's been, been processed. Um, I'm trying to think what else. There's apricot oil people will use as well. So anything like that, a nice light oil, that you could even use for cooking, you can use in here, just not something like canola oil, again, because it's refined and it's processed. So what we're going to do is we're going to put some hoiva oil in. Now we say two tablespoons. This is completely to preference. Two tablespoons for us, it's not too wet, it's not too dry. Some people like a scrub that's a little more loose, a little more wet. Other people do not. My husband does not like a scrub that's very like wet, to be honest with you. So I'm gonna put, it's about 15, to get about two tablespoons. And Megan's gonna mix this. And while she's mixing, I'll tell you why we use hoiba oil. So hoiba, J-O-J-B-A, I'll show you the bottle. I'll come up and show you. What about coconut oil? Yeah, coconut oil is awesome for this. That's another great, great oil. It's wonderful. This particular one comes from a company called the Hoiba Company. They're up in Maine. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Hoiba itself is a nut. It comes off the hoiba tree. That can be found in the Middle East. It can be found right in the Southwest here in the United States. It grows in very hot, um, very dry regions. The reason we use it in our classes, we don't know your medical background. We don't know what allergies you have, especially our teens. So hoiva is hypoallergenic. We don't have to worry about, do you have a nut allergy? Do you have you know, a skin, skin condition? It's hypoallergenic. It is a humicant, which means that it attracts moisture and locks it in. So we want a product that's going to, to moisturize. It cleans the skin. I use Hoiba on my skin every single day on my face. It cleans the skin. As I mentioned, it moisturizes as a humicant. It heals the skin. And it also is something called a fixative. So a fixative, if you were to smell this Hoiba, it does have a very light, kind of a very light nutty scent to it. Some people pick it up, some people don't. We've had people tell us it smells like, like smoke, like barbecue smoke. I'm like, oh my gosh, but that's not uncommon. Everyone smells things a little bit differently depending on their olfactory system, their sense of smell. The bottom line is that very, very, very subtle scent does not transfer into the product. What a fixative does is it looks for heavier molecules to attach itself to and it mimics their scent. So two drops of lavender would smell like four drops of lavender. Um, we want a product that's going to make our, our essential oils smell stronger than they, they actually are because too much essential oil is not always the best thing. And we want something that will really get along well with our essential oils. That's the reason we use Hoiba. If you use any of the other uh, carrier oils, as they're called, they're oils that help the essential oils get carried into your skin safely, but almond oil, sunflower oil, sapphire, uh, safflower, 
grapeseed oil, et cetera, are not fixatives. So you won't have that added benefit. The other thing, of course, is that it looks to balance the pH in our bodies. It tries to mimic the sebaceous gland, the second layer or second shelf of our skin. That's where a lot of our toxins are. Um, blackheads, whiteheads, acne at any age, whether you're a teenager or, or going through menopause, that's a whole other set of acne. Um, that's where it comes from, that second layer of skin. Hoyaba seeps right in, it's very light. Um, it seeps right into that second layer and it looks to balance the pH. Uh, it'll actually clean the skin out. It's wonderful. One of our favorite products. So we put this in, and Meg, do you think this is good? Yeah. Yeah, Meg, it's okay. Um, and again, you can go a little more wet, a little more dry. So now for the essential oils. All right. So today we're gonna be adding five drops of each. Uh, five drops of, in this case, orange. Hang on one second for me. Five drops of lime, if you see my recipe. Five drops of lime, five drops of lemon, and five drops of tea tree. Megan loves tea tree. I like eucalyptus. I happen to actually have lemon eucalyptus here, but we're already putting in some lemon, so I'm gonna hang off on that. Now let's say you can't stand tea tree oil. That's okay, you can replace it with something else. We're using lime, lemon, and tea tree because they are antibacterial, antifungal, antimicrobial, uh, and antiviral. That said, with the exception of the line, that said, antiviral doesn't mean anti-COVID-19. Uh, we don't even know what, what causes that or what, the, what they refer to as the Achilles heel of that, how to kind of slay it. So these are great essential oils. They help to build the immune system. Uh, they have all those wonderful added benefits but again, we cannot dispense kind of medical advice and we would say to you, please, you know, don't say I've got the miracle cure, you know. Um, I wish we knew what the miracle cure for that was, but these are wonderful. They will clean the skin. They will keep it, again, bacteria free, microbial free, germ free. Um, but, uh, and we know that they're antiviral and properties, but there's so many different types of viruses. You can't say it specifically cures one thing over another. The biggest thing is that they're all very bright emotionally. So when we make any blend with essential oils, we're looking for the physical, the emotional, and even the spiritual benefit. We have a lot of people come to us for spiritual use um, of essential oils. So the physical benefits, antibacterial, antimicrobial, antifungal, antiviral in some of the cases, the emotional, citrus oils are happy essential oils. They are uplifting, they are energizing. They put a smile on your face. If we were to have dropped the uh, essential oil orange in, uh, Megan would have been smiling ear to ear right now. That is the happiest of all the citruses. And it's really true. It's amazing when you work with these oils, people will say, gosh, you have so much energy and, and you're always smiling. That's the oils. The oils are absolutely just so uplifting. Um, so from an emotional perspective, they're wonderful. Tea tree will do the same. Tea tree, again, has a little bit of medicinal smell. Some people love it. Some people are not fans of it. Um, any of these can be switched out. Let's say I don't have lime essential oil or lemon. I can use orange. I can use grapefruit. I can use Mei Chang as a beautiful, deeper, exotic essential oil. They all have the same benefits. They're all antimicrobial, antifungal antibacterial, some of them antiviral. Um, I can switch out the tea tree for the eucalyptus. The point here is the oils we're using while uplifting, they're germ fighters. And if I have a hand scrub and I'm trying to wash my hands after I've been cleaning chicken or if I've been out in my yard, I want something that's going to clean everything off. I don't want to worry later on, oh my gosh, did I get well, all well, the chicken off? Did I, oh my gosh, did I, you know, bring in dirt and I can't see it is, you know, and, and is it a microbe? And that's what this does. They are such great germ fighters. So uh, that is the reason for our mix. Now we can kick this up a notch. You want to? I'm going to let Megan loose with the knives. Do you remember? <laughs> we can never remember what this call is called. It's not a mandolin, a mandalusia. Macalona, we can never remember. We call it the rocking knife at our house. Anyway, um, we can add to this. And that's what we're going to do. So Meg, I'm gonna let you do a couple things. First things first, one of the coolest things you can do, if you add live product, you have to remember, you can't keep this for six months. Live product, like in anything, will turn. But one of the cool things we can do 
is add live rind. So you can take lemon, you can take orange. I got my orange in, just a tiny little bit even, and you can mix that right in there. We've just got our little handheld grater. You can mix that right in. That will have the added benefits. Essential oil of orange, we get from the rind of orange. So you're actually getting that little exfoliant feeling. It'll dry out as, as it's in the product, um, remember, we have our deep sea salt, which will take the moisture out and allow that, that rind to dry a little bit. So we can add that in, but we're getting that scent. We're getting those beautiful properties, the antimicrobial, antifungal, antibacterial, because we're getting the essential oil right out of the rind itself. So Megan could have played around with that, made it you know, a little more, whatever, that's fine. Just a cool thing. You do that with lemon, any of the citruses. When we are done, what we do is I cut up fruit and I put it in a big pot of boiling water. Sometimes I'll put it in like a frying pan, like where it's, it's a little more shallow and I let it boil. And then I wander around the house. And if you're one of our neighbors and see me in the bay window, you might wonder what the heck the Penske's are doing. What I'm doing is letting the citrus steam clean my house. Uh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful germ fighter and it cleans the air as well. Uh, lemon especially is a disinfectant. You know, every one of these essential oils, while I've named certain properties because we want them in our product, many of them have so many properties. So uh, lemon in particular is a disinfecting. Uh, orange just smells so amazing. It puts everybody in a good mood. If you're having one of those days or somebody in the house is just having one of those days, a little orange, uh, you know, orange boiling in a, a pot and let that, that citrus out, it's wonderful orange in a diffuser. I would not use live orange in a diffuser. It will actually affect your motor in the diffuser, uh, but just a little orange essential oil, any of the citruses, they're so uplifting. So the next product we're gonna be using here is rosemary. Now, normally you're gonna get rosemary. I have rosemary in my garden, but I wanted to show you the dry kind. So not everybody has it in their garden. So the rosemary you get in the store for culinary use is the same rosemary we're using here. It does tend to be larger. You could try to put it in, but I'm gonna be honest with you, um, I've done things like that. I always say learn from my mistakes. When you go to put it on your hands, you definitely feel like you've gotten a splinter um, here or there, it gets stuck. So what we do, and this is where I'll let Meg come in here and, and cut it up. She's gonna just rock it. You can take a um, regular old knife, um, you know, whatever you have. We just happen to have this, it gives us something to, to use and you wanna just, get that back together. And we're gonna just cut this up into smaller pieces. Why use rosemary? Again, it's gonna Sarah. be, yeah. All right, so I have a few questions before you move on. Great. Somebody had asked if um, eucalyptus and tea tree are about the same thing for sanitizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they absolutely are. You can mix, mix and match one for the other, lavender too. Um, they all have the same, same benefit profile. Uh, both of them, I understand even all three of them, have other attributes, but as far as uh, antimicrobial, antifungal, antibacterial, either or, you mix and match whatever you want. Lemon eucalyptus is another option too, which comes from a lemon eucalyptus plant. A lot of people think it's like maybe a blend of two. It's not, that's a great question. Somebody said, is it a very fine grater, a rasp that you used for the? Uh... For the orange? Yes. Yeah, no, it's just a handheld. It's nothing uh, too crazy. I'll bring it over to you. We should, next time we do this, Kel, we got to figure out how to do the uh, handheld, the foam. <laughs> the kind you get. Yeah, the normal, normal, normal holes, yeah. Nothing crazy. It's not, like, it's not one of those very fancy or historic kinds. I and mean, listen, we could go that route, absolutely. But then you're not going to want to mimic that at home. You know what I'm saying? We want to make yeah. it as easy as possible. Let's say that you don't have that knife. Just use a regular old knife. Um, if you don't have a, like a grater like this, we have a regular box grater. It's, it was my mom's kind of thing. My mom gave it to me when she bought a new one. You know, just a regular old box grater that you would maybe grate whatever, cheese on or whatever the case is. Use what you have. If you don't even have that and you're daring enough, um, you know, peel a little bit of the orange off and just try to get, shave it off with a, a sharper knife, try to get some of that peel off. And you don't have to do that. These are just added features, you know, to, uh, to this. Why the rosemary? Well, the rosemary in this case is also going to add, add, as I mentioned, a little exfoliant, just like our salts. We want that exfoliant feeling. Uh, we want to get rid of dead skin cells. We want to get our skin, our, our blood circulating. 
But rosemary does many things. When you cut it up, just like Megan did, yes, it's, it's better because it feels better, but you're also releasing any essential oils, even in the dried rosemary. It is amazing for the respiratory system. Opens the respiratory system right up, rosemary does. It is a great pain reliever. It is great for hair growth. So um, I was talking about my hair earlier um, in the program, but I definitely, at least now, since we've been home probably three times a week, make a rosemary conditioning rinse. Um, I go take a shower, I wash my hair, but while that is going on, I have already poured into a bowl about this size, eh, maybe a quarter cup of rosemary. I actually put it in a, a little tea, um, what are those called? For the loose tea. Diffuser. Tea diffuser. diffuser. Yeah. yeah, and here I'm talking about air diffusers and it's tea diff I have a couple different things for, for our tea kettles. And um, I'll put that rosemary in with boiling hot water and let it sit there, just let it seep. And when you come out of the shower, some time has gone by and the water actually turns a, a sage color. So you know the essential oils have gotten out. That's what that sage color is. The essential oils with dry rosemary as well as fresh are now released. I actually take a towel, the towel that's been on my head, I stick it in that water, let it all soak up. It sounds so messy and it never is. I flip my hair over, I do a Carmen Miranda style, you know, wrap. And it acts almost like if, you, um, if you're like me, if you're of my age, like VO5, that remember that real deep conditioner VO5 is really great, Megan, you missed out. It's probably still around. Um, but this not only acts like that, it's a deep conditioner. Rosemary cleans the scalp. It's great for hair growth. It's great for building um, strength in your hair. And it leaves the most amazing control and shine. And everyone's hair smells different. Some people, like when Megan does it, her hair smells like strawberry. When I do it, my hair smells like peppermint. It just depends on your body's chemical makeup. Um, it's just a beautiful thing. You could do it every single day. Um, you don't have to, but you know, if you did it once a year even, you notice the difference. It's a really, really nice product. We want it because it's gonna open up our respiratory system. It's a pain reliever also. So again, if I'm out in the garden or if I've been doing work in the house that I, I haven't normally been doing, maybe painting. Um, a lot of people, I, everybody but us has painted. Um, I need my bathroom painted. So that's my little like, you know, list of things to do that have not gotten done during this pandemic. Anyway, but if you're somebody that doesn't normally paint, your hands are aching usually the next day. It's a pain reliever, Rosemary. It's got so many uses to it. So we like it in there for that. And the last herb we're gonna put in is a little bit of lavender. This one comes from my garden. We could have gone fancy. Maybe I'll do a little fancy for us tonight. And we could put lavender buds in. We have some of those. They're only gonna act as a little bit of an exfoliant. They're gonna make my products. See, Megan lets me loose with the product and I knock it all over the place. They're gonna make my product just pretty is what they're gonna wind up doing. So when it's done, it'll look nice. It'll act as an exfoliant. Yes, you will get from a dried lavender bud, you'll get some of the benefits. Um, you know, again, lavender, antibacterial, antimicrobial, uh, antifungal, definitely antiviral. So relaxing, you know, it, it definitely is known to calm the central nervous system down. And we can also put in some either live or dried lavender uh, leaves, some of the stem. And I got that right out of my garden. My lavender is taken off this year, which is nice. I lost some of it last year. And that's it. I'm gonna, you wanna show them this? Uh, Megan is my, my expert uh, <laughs> volunteer here. So what do we do? Once we, are done. I will put this by, again, my kitchen sink, wherever you need it. And I will use it the way I would soap. I'll take a little bit of it, put it under some nice warm water, and I will wash my hands. I wash all the way up to my elbows. I'm one of those crazy hand washing people. Uh, you can take a little nail brush and, and use this even on your nails, under your nails, especially if you've been using, you know, cutting meat or out in the garden where things can get trapped. Um, and then you rinse your hands just like you would soap. But in this case, because you have some, some oil in there, some hoiva and some essential oil, you don't want to now go and just dry your hands off because now you're wiping off anything that's still sitting on the surface. Take a nice paper towel and simply pat your hands dry. Give it a minute because the hoiva oil in particular seeps right into the skin. Almond oil is going to take a little longer to seep in. Um, olive oil seeps in pretty fast, but not as fast as the whole oil. Pat that dry so that you get the extra added benefits of uh, the skin moisturizer, which also softens the skin, 
and keeps it healthy. And it's that simple. Um, you would store it, again, I put plastic over this or we can put it in a jar like this. In this particular case, we actually have some in here that I could add to this if I want, if you want to mix that up since it's been sitting in there. Um, anyway, and now I just added to that. And we keep, it's so easy to do and it's so quick. The first time you do it, you go, okay, I put a little bit of this and you realize it takes all of a couple minutes to really put this together. You don't need the fresh herbs. It's just an added feature tonight. And even if you don't have essential oils, here I am in aromatherapy saying this, even if you don't have essential oils, that is okay. Just to get that exfoliating feeling, to get the dead skin off, to get the microbes off, go with the salt. If that's all you have and you don't, you don't want to use salt, at least you have the salt and that will be a nice mix that with a little bit of whatever, olive oil, holy oil, whatever the case is. And you've got a really nice, easy, basic scrub um, that you can use, you know, table salt and, you know, whatever's in your cabinet. And if you have some essential oils, definitely put them in there. Um, again, we wanted a healthy hand sanitizing one, but if you are someone that says, you know what, I love lavender. You know, it helps calm me down. I just love the smell of it. You can just make a lavender hand scrub. That's wonderful too. It also has the added benefits of being germ fighters. So that's it. Any questions? Yes, <laughs> right. I have a few. First one is, can you just let your hands air dry? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I do that myself, but not everybody likes that feeling. I actually, I, Megan hates it. I, I don't mind it at all. So I'm just, yeah. I actually do one of these and, you know, walk away. Absolutely. Okay, two more. How long do the essential oils last and do they lose their potency or change their smell over the years? Absolutely. So there's going to be a few things with that. Um, every essential oil is different. So there are some essential oils that are really have a true shelf life of six months. Some of them are 16 years. And before you go out and buy the 16 or even 20 year ones, the ones that are, are like that tend to be what they call very resinous or they come from the root. They always smell, they always smell like dirt, but they're wonderful. Um, there's one, one wonderful uh, oil that's great for, believe it or not, the respiratory system and rheumatoid arthritis, it's called finger root. And it smells as bad as it sounds. It smells like dirt, but it's really, really great for certain skin conditions. So how do you know? Well, there's several ways. First of all, we always recommend, there's a wonderful website, um, and I know your library has some great books, and I know that that's limited right now, but there's a wonderful website called Aroma Web, A-R-O-M-A web.com. Um, the woman that oversees that website is actually a clinical aromatherapist. She has a nursing background. She could have done anything in aromatherapy. She was one of the kind of the pioneers in clinical aromatherapy. And she said, you know, there is this gap in information that everyday people can, can look for instead of going and getting books and, and trying to figure things out. So she has created this website. It's been around for years where you can look up, you know, sweet orange oil. What's the basic shelf life? Anywhere from five to seven years. Um, things like Hoyaba, it never actually never expires. Hoyaba has a forever shelf life. It never goes rancid. You can put it in the, the hot, the cold, you can cook with it. Um, a lot of people don't realize that. Whereas sweet almond oil does not have as long a shelf life. Um, I think sweet almond oil, I think you can get about 10 to 15 years. It also depends on the company that you're using. So, you know, where they're making their, where they're getting their oils from and, and bottling them, how they're shipping them. Are you keeping them, once they get to your house, are you keeping them in a cool, dark spot out of the way? We have oils in, our, in a refrigerator. I know that sounds crazy, but please understand, we have a tremendous amount of essential oils. We do this all year, but we also have oils we don't even use with classes that, you know, we use for a lot of different things. You know, if you can keep them cool, that's wonderful. But not everyone can do that. So keep them in a nice, dark place out of the sun. The moment the sun gets to them, that longevity just gets cut in half. If I were to keep this mixture out in the open, the oils are fleeting, especially citruses. They're very, uh, what they call uh, top note oils. They're very light. They want to escape. So we usually would, I would normally just wrap this up right away, but we're in class. So we try to trap those oils and keep them in there. If you smell, one moment it smells like lemon, and then, you know, a week later you open up and you go, God, it doesn't quite smell like lemon anymore. You're going to notice two things. Either an oil is no longer effective when you can't smell it any longer, or it's not effective when it doesn't smell like it should, and it's gone rancid. Get rid of that, get rid of the products that have that oil in, and get rid of the bottle. 
Um, the other thing too is for every essential oil that is out there, for example, I will give you this line. This comes from a company called Aromatics International. Um, we're not endorsing them, it just happens to be who we for years have gotten our oils, a lot of our oils from. They're extremely potent, um, we love them. But the biggest thing I love about their company is that for every bottle I buy, they're different batches. I can look up the batch number when I buy it, I buy them online, so when I look up the batch number, I can tell when it was harvested, when it was distilled. They tell you right then and there what the shelf life is. They're very transparent. They will give you the entire chemical breakdown. And most people don't care about the chemical breakdown. When you do aromatherapy, those are little things you care about. But I always tell people it's kind of like my grandfather used to and grandmother used to go back and forth to Florida. And in the 70s, you didn't really pick up a phone and call. It was very expensive to call long distance. So my grandfather was a very big letter writer. And right around March, depending on what was going on up here on Long Island, uh, weather-wise, my grandfather would write the letter that said the oranges are coming. So we knew this box of oranges would be arriving. It was a big to-do. And some years, the oranges were great. And other years, we'd get a letter, you know, that letter saying, listen, the oranges were terrible. They had a drought, a cold spell. They had a, a freeze, a snow fell in the middle of Orlando, or whatever the case is, or it was too wet, whatever the case was. And it changed the chemical composition of the orange making it making them really not taste very good so they weren't you wouldn't you know bring them up to us or send them up to us essential oils are the same way the batch that you get will you know if you use a company that is very transparent and these companies want to be if they're spending the money to send it out to be tested and stuff like that um they'll tell you the chemical breakdown so maybe when i'm looking at the chemical breakdown maybe this batch of lime is great for the respiratory system, whereas the one from say six months ago or last year, or whatever the case was, really wasn't as effective with the respiratory system. Maybe it was better with antibacterial properties. So you have to educate yourself as you go, but there's no stock answer. And they are, they never, you know, you'll never find one that lasts forever. Um, they all have a shelf life, every one of them. And every one of them's a little different. That was a very long-winded answer, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, one, uh, two more. Um, can you say the rosemary hair wrap again? Oh, what yeah. you do with that? One of these days we have to do that for you. It's so easy. Um, so what you do is you take a, 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 a I guess, what, I guess, would you take a bowl, right? That's what I do. I take a bowl of, of boiling water, tea water. That's all I do. I put the tea kettle on. I wait for it to boil. I put water in. And it doesn't have to be, you know, you decide what you want. I would say it's probably about three cups maybe. You don't even need that much at all, two cups. Um, it's, it's like a, about this much. So that's maybe about two cups. And I put about a quarter of a cup of dried rosemary in. You can absolutely use real rosemary. Personally, I like to save the real rosemary for culinary use if I can. Um, and then I also, if in the fall, I'll dry my own rosemary out. I just like to do that. Um, so you'll take about a quarter of a cup, which would be about this much. Do you want to see if you want to grab a bowl really quick? Hang on, Megan, we're going to show this to you. And I'm going to be honest, even this is a little too much. I say a quarter of a cup. I would probably use about an eighth of a cup. You don't need that much at all. I usually put it in a tea diffuser. We have several of them out there. Yeah, sure. Megan's going to fill up a bowl of water. And then I put this in and I let it seep. Now, by letting it seep, uh, the essential oils are being released. So you've got your hot water. Now, be very careful, though. You want to make sure that water is cool enough to go on your head. You don't want to wind up burning yourself. Um, thanks, honey. I don't know if the, yeah, this is not hot. But I would put this in. Again, you can put it in loose, absolutely, but you're going to be fishing out the rosemary. I don't ever mind doing that, but some people are not fans. I do use tea diffusers. I've got several of them around. Uh, that we will use and I just seep that that um, rosemary in. I wait until I can see that screen but I gotta take, tell you it only takes a couple minutes. By the time I get out of the shower um, I run into the kitchen and it is done. I take the towel that's on my hair, I put it into the water. Now take the part of the towel that's wet, that's already a little wet, seep it in the water, it gets absorbed. I know this sounds crazy, you don't need an entire wet towel, it's only what's going to go on your head. I flip my head over, put that towel around, wrap it up, and I let it sit there. 10, 15 minutes, it doesn't, it sounds like it's gonna be a mess, it never is. The craziest thing is when you, when you take a shower and wash your hair, you open up the follicles of your hair. 
a lot of people when they're done washing their hair will use like cool water to rinse the hair off. In this process, I don't do that. That closes up the hair follicle. So I leave them open for a minute, get that rosemary back, you know, that towel back on my hair full of the rosemary water and the follicle is still open. So the essential oil of rosemary is just being sucked up my uh, strands of hair. I will also too, if I think that maybe my hair is a little dry or I don't know, my scalp is itchy and I'm worried about, oh my gosh, do I have dandruff? I'll throw in either a peppermint leaf for my garden or a drop, all you need is one drop of peppermint. Even if you put two drops by accident, that's okay, but anything more than that, and it's too much. Your, your hair like doesn't tingle. It, it actually sort of almost feels like it's burning. Um, peppermint is a very hot essential oil, but it's great for the scalp. So people will sometimes put a drop of that in too. As soon as I'm done, again, 10, maybe 15 minutes, I'll be honest, there are days where I'm like, yeah, I'm sort of like sick of doing this for a few minutes and I'll just take the towel off if I get bored or if I've got to go get clothes on, you know, like get, get dressed for the day, whatever the case is. Um, and then I rinse my hair in the sink. I'll use the kitchen sink. Um, I'll rinse my hair with cool water, take that towel, throw it in the wash, take a dry towel and just dry my hair and then go about, you know, doing my hair as normal. Uh, so does that, are there any questions with that? It's a really cool, great, um, recipe that I learned when I was a kid. My mom taught it to me. Um, my parents, my mom's side of the family, they were farmers out in Nassau County. And it was something that my mom showed me when I was a very, very young girl that I have used for forever. So and I think it's why at the age of almost 50, I, I don't have to dye my hair yet or anything like that. I, I swear it's the rosemary. My mom says it's just good genes. I don't know. But uh, she's been dyeing her hair since she was 18. So, so I don't know. Um, but that's a quick, quick rundown on that. It's a lot of fun. It's easy to do. And it's, it's so cheap. When you see how much your hairstylist charges for conditioner in a store, you know, you look at the, the hair places, they're $50, $60, sometimes even more. You know, this is great for your hair. It's a pure product. It's rosemary and water. It's not, there's nothing chemical in it, you know? So it's got my vote. I love it. Okay. Somebody commented, commented that you both have beautiful hair and skin. <laughs> Thanks. It's the lighting. <laughs> we need hair. And then somebody <laughs> asked about the hand scrubs. Are they a disinfectant? Do you still need to rinse with soap? Oh, good question. Yeah, no, they, they are in place of soap. If you use lemon, lemon is a disinfectant all in itself. Um, but, you know, most people don't look at soap from a disinfecting perspective. They're looking at it from an antibacterial perspective. Um, and again, as soap makers, it's, we have conversations with people. Antibacterial, antifungal, antimicrobial, antiviral. If you want, are looking specifically for uh, disinfecting properties, lemon is your go-to. Tea tree is your go-to as well. There's a reason why many products on store shelves for bathrooms and say dishwasher products have lemon in them or your even a lemon fresh whatever for your laundry. Um, that is, is the reason because they are looking for those disinfecting properties. So if you're looking for that, make sure you include lemon, especially. Lemon eucalyptus will work as well. Tea tree will work. That's a great question. And that's it. Oh, all right. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for spending time with us and, uh, and, you know, asking questions, especially this is definitely a unique way of teaching for us that we have been embracing since the, I think the beginning of May. And uh, we thank you for, for coming in our home and just enjoying what we do. So thanks so very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, have right. a great weekend, everybody. Take Bye. care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye. Bye-bye, Tony.